good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're watching from. We appreciate you uh, joining us, uh, spending your hard-earned time with us. Uh, I'll do intros in just a moment, but hopefully everyone's here for building microservice systems without cooking your laptop. Going remote and we'll explain what that means in a minute, but going remote with Docker, Telepresence, and Kubernetes. Let's press on. I always like to start talks with a kind of key takeaways, right? TLDR uh, helps me frame the sort of discussion we're going to have, right? And it hopefully helps set for yourselves at home and in the office uh, what kind of questions you might uh, want to be thinking about as we're going along. So you can pick myself and Felipe's brains at the end when we're going to do a live Q&A. Um, but yeah, let's just set the stage, right? Now, I've done a bunch of work over the years on microservices, containers, Kubernetes, all that goodness, and it provides a lot of benefits. Hopefully, many of you are experiencing those. But the inner dev loop can be painful with microservices. There's just more things, right? More services than the classic monolith. And Kubernetes and containers are fantastic, give a lot of flexibility, but they add more layers in the stack. So we've got to adapt the way we kind of do development and testing. So a lot of benefits. There is a few challenges. Docker Desktop for me is a fantastic portal onboarding you know, tool to get you on your journey to cloud native, to that elastic compute, that flexible deployment. Containers are your vehicle, so I've used the analogy right, to get you there. And Docker Desktop is a fantastic local developer portal, developer experience to get you started. And Felipe is going to run through some extensions uh, that we're going to, and we're going to demonstrate the Telepresence extension in just a moment as well. But Docker Desktop that you know and love has got better recently with extensions, and that's what we're going to look at today. We're also going to focus on Telepresence, open source CNCF tool donated by the Ambassador Labs crew, uh, team. And Telepresence proxies your local machine into the cluster, giving you that fast feedback loop. And don't worry if that doesn't make sense at the moment. We'll break it down as some of the pain points and some of the you know, solutions in just a moment. But know that when you do go to developing on a remote cluster, getting access to that remote cluster and those fast feedback loops is quite tricky without a tool like Telepresence. And Docker Desktop Extension, which I believe is my next point, ta -da, makes it even easier. If you're not super comfortable on the CLI, I mean, I will show some CLI demos, but if you're not super comfortable on the CLI, would rather be in your IDE, would rather be in Docker Desktop, the extensions make it much easier for you to work with tools like Telepresence. So we'll give you a demo of that as well. And finally, the takeaway with all these things, Docker Desktop, Telepresence, it's your path to production, right? We as developers have got that business idea, we've got some KPIs, some experiments we're going to run. We want to get through to production and we want to get that fast feedback loop going at the big level, right? And Telepresence and Docker Desktop support several workflows. We're going to focus a lot on development today, but also, you know, CI, CD you want to think about, testing you want to think about. And all these tools we're going to demo support that workflow, reduce the friction for you as cloud native developers, which is what we all want, right? So that's setting the scene, hopefully your two hosts for the day. Myself, Daniel Bryant, UK, on most of the interwebs. I run DevRel here at Ambassador Labs. Previous background is Java development, did a bunch of ops work, been using Docker since, well, pre 1.0. I've got my old school swag in the background here. It's DockerCon 2015 I went to, and I presented at a bunch of DockerCons. Love me some Docker, and Ambassador Labs and Docker are obviously very good friends. And Felipe, joining me from Docker today. Say, say hello to the folks, Felipe. Hey everyone. So my name is Felipe. I'm a software engineer at Docker. I'm working in the extensions SDK team. So pretty much uh, allowing people to develop extensions through the SDK. Um, well, in the past, I have been working yeah, with Kubernetes as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting journey. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be part of this. Super. Thank you, Felipe. And Felipe was really helpful in our early journey with using extensions. You're one of our promoters, Felipe, so really appreciate the shout out you did on LinkedIn and Twitter. And we've worked quite closely together since, which is and Felipe's feedback and the team at Docker's feedback on our extension has been super useful as we've kind of built the Telepresence extension out. So more on that in just a moment. But let's crack on. Setting the scene, right? The inner and outer dev loop is hopefully a lot something like a lot of you recognize. We've got this inner dev loop as engineers. If you're doing like classic test-driven development, it's your red-green refactor, your TDD loop, right? Um, and then once you're happy with that kind of work you're doing, you then want to promote it through for your peers to look at, maybe doing a code review, <clears throat> and you also want to push that code through CI and CD. You want to run some verification. You want to look at things like security, super important, right? You want to think, look at things like uh, observability, extensibility, that outer dev loop is where all that verification happens. But you're constantly moving from that inner dev loop that how does my service interact with that other service type situation? Or how does that you know, bit of code, that, that bit of logic I need to create, how does it work given these edge cases? 
And then once you're happy locally, or once you're happy within the inner dev loop, you move through to the outer dev loop, GitHub Actions, Spinnaker, you know, Jenkins, take your pick, right? Now with microservices, there's just more things, right? So I did a lot of work on Java monoliths, showing my age here, but back in 2000, early 2000s, I was working a lot on Oracle systems, big databases, um, ESBs, message queues, heavyweight stuff, right? The original version of SOA, service-oriented architecture, popped up at the time, but microservices has really made it you know, practical for most of us, right? But the thing I often see with microservice projects, I worked on a bunch around 2010 time, and sort of as, as it became popular to, through to 2015, once you get to the tipping point of being happy with microservices, you get the Cambrian explosion. And then there's just more things for me in the inner loop to interact with, right? Now, I want to stay local as often as possible, and we'll cover some more of that later in terms of mocking, service virtualization. But the reality is sometimes I need to reach out to other services, poke around, check out the API, bring that back into my inner dev loop, and then you know build my code accordingly. There's just more dependencies. Often, you know, in addition to services, you've got a message queue, a lightweight database or something running in the cloud. There's just more stuff up there. First thoughts are let's run everything locally, right? Particularly if you're a small shop or you haven't got product market fit, running everything locally, maybe start with a monolith, right? A couple of services, running everything locally is a great start. Don't start branching out into remote, you know, Kubernetes clusters when you don't need to, because that can add extra complexity. And I'm a big fan of running everything locally, Docker, Docker desktop, right? Keeps it nice and simple. You can spin up a Kubernetes cluster, I'll be honest, I often stay in Docker Compose and just Docker as long as possible. But when the company gets to a certain size, when I was consulting, we then branch out into you know, Mesos or Kubernetes now, that kind of thing. But my advice is stay local as long as you can. There's other solutions out there. I use Minikube Bunch as well and some other tools out there. But you know, naturally, for me, Docker became my second IDE. I'm a big JetBrains fan. You'll see IntelliJ on show in just a moment. But once Docker Desktop popped up, this is where I'm looking at my container images. This is where I'm looking you know, at logs and things. And now with the extensions, there's even more reason to stay in, in Docker Desktop. So I'm constantly flicking between my IDE and then what I'm calling the second IDE, right? My developer portal in Docker Desktop. If you're successful, that's what we're all here for, right? You get product market fit, business goes well, you've got to scale up your app. You know, the notorious BIG said, right, more money, more problems. I'm saying more services, more problems. It's a good problem. You're scaling out, right? It's still a problem. As you get more services, there's more things to orchestrate when you're doing that local setup. And let's be honest, once you get to a certain point, and I'm going to poke fun at the JVM because I do a lot of Java, so I'm allowed to, right? Once you get to a certain point, my local laptop simply can't cope. It literally starts smoking, right? In terms of like, we've heard stories of developers having to put frozen peas under their laptop, right? Uh, that's a legit story we heard from our VP of engineering. Uh, me personally, I've got some external fans I put onto my laptop if I'm doing too much. Um, so you can only get so far locally. Um, the sheer volume of services, you know, the JVM is quite memory hungry, uh, heat-based, um, you know, JVM, CLR and .NET, I'm not just going to pick on Java, there's other ones too, but there's only so many things you can run locally, right? So then you go, the pendulum swings. I saw this when I was consulting a lot. Let's go to the cloud, give every developer a remote Kubernetes cluster, give them their own dev environment, their own you know, mini staging environment, or maybe you're sharing staging environments, this kind of stuff. Pick your poison, right? There's a bunch of great solutions out there. I'm constantly using Sivo at the moment. I'll hat tip the Sivo folks for remote clusters. Um, and this, you know, this is interesting as a solution, but the pendulum can often swing too far in that it's hard to maintain those remote environments. If you've got 100 developers and 100 different environments, what's the chance they're all going to be in sync at any one time, let alone the cost of running 100 environments, right? But just imagine keeping those environments in sync. It's really, really hard. Compose and you know, Kubernetes YAML can help you at these kind of things. It's still a challenge to be aware of. And one thing I mention is if you go to that full remote model, the inner and outer dev loop can become the same, right? You're writing code, you're building a container, you're pushing it to that remote registry, you're deploying to a cluster, and you're running a test. And then you go back and do it all again, right? And this is slow. Trust me, it's like the old school when I was learning basic, doing print lines in my basic, right? And then, you know, rerunning, da -da -da, print line, got here, line 10, whatever, rerun, da -da -da, super slow. And it breaks me out of my, my zone, my you know, fast feedback loop as a developer. Automation can help. There are a bunch of tools that automate the Docker build, Docker push in the background, scaffold, garden, bunch of tools I'll, I'll shout out. 
a lot of them work on synchronizing file systems. So there's still some element of shipping artifacts around from your local to remote machine. That can suck up bandwidth. If you're not on a great connection, it can be a challenge, but there are tools just to be aware of that can help with this Docker build, Docker push, and watching what changes you're doing uh, in the background. And I'll actually run on, I'll show you some demos with a scaffold dev tool um, just in a moment as well. Critically, you want that fast in a dev loop sometimes. You don't want to do the Docker build and push. Docker build and push is fantastic for in the CI moment, right? In the continuous integration moment. But in my inner dev loop, I want to be in the zone. I want to be just in the IDE without constantly dropping, you know, to the second IDE of doing Docker build, Docker push. Critically, I want to use my own tools sometimes. I want to run a debugger, a profiler locally. It can be challenging to kind of map these things together, right? When you're running remote services, possible but tricky sometimes. And of course, there is that classic, you want to avoid the works on, you know, works on my machine. There's got to put this meme in at this given point, right? What you're seeing in production versus what you're running, you know, in a staging environment or locally, you want to avoid that drift. You want to be as production-like as possible uh, as early on in your SDLC as possible. The answer, telepresence. Docker extensions, right? This is the answer. And if you haven't bumped into extensions, I'll let Felipe talk to this. They are fantastic. And more and more folks I'm chatting to are becoming aware of extensions. And Felipe, I'll, I'll leave the floor to you for a second and give me a shout when you want me to stop sharing. And I know you want to do some demos. So, Sure. Thank you, Daniel. So what about Docker extensions? So at Docker, we have been working on how to improve the experience for developers to increase uh, productivity, how they work with other people, how to solve their problems uh, by building extensions. So with this, what you can actually do is to develop your own extension and extend the functionality. For instance, we can see in the picture how we can see the this usage extensions, like how many Im images, containers, volumes, how much space is being used, and clean that up with a single click in a button. You can also see logs from multiple containers at the same time. So at Docker, this is very useful for us because we can mm, ship features very, very fast. And at the same time for you, it's gonna be very helpful because if you have a favorite tool like K9S, for instance, you know, if you wanna see uh, your Kubernetes cluster resources, well, you can actually try to work with that one, embed that as a tool inside Docker Desktop. So it, it means that it's a distribution channel for your tooling as well. So if you have a product that you want to promote, I mean, Docker Desktop is used by a million of developers. So it's a really good platform to, to make some publicity as well. Yes, Fantastically, so now, let me just yes. stop sharing. Yeah, if you don't mind, yeah, I'm going to share the screen and quickly go through Docker extension. So this is Docker Desktop, and here on the left, if you have the latest version of Docker, you will see these add extensions, which that which uh, drive you to the extension marketplace. So here you can see a bunch of extensions that have been developed by uh, partners, by community, by essentially everyone that has submitted one of these extensions to the to the marketplace. Um, you can inspect this extension, you can install it, you can open it or remove it, and you have screenshots and all the description. Um, this is just an image, basically. So when you install the extension, then you can go inside it and see this kind of new UI inside Docker Desktop, right? So in, in this example, we are see, we're having a look at the resource usage extension, which is similar to Docker Stats, but on asteroids, let's say, let's say. So it's basically a nice UI on top of Docker stats where you can see how much CPU, memory, the number of containers that are running, and all that inside a table that you can sort, filter, but also you have a chart view where you can see uh, over time how many resources are being used by your containers inside Docker desktop, right? Um, we also have other extensions like, uh, for instance, security extensions like Anchor, Aqua Trivi, or Kubernetes like Ambassador Telepresence, uh, Octeto, OpenShift. So we, we have a bunch of them. Um, so this is the whole point of it. Try to build a UI on top of Docker Desktop that allows you to improve your productivity and work better with your team members. So in this example, you can see Trivi, which is an extension to scan images and detect vulnerabilities or generate as bombs. So for instance, if we type Ubuntu latest, it's an, it's an image that I have here locally or that I could even pull from Docker Hub. You can see that it makes a scan. It tells you how many 
vulnerabilities you have, uh, what type of vulnerability, critical high, et cetera. Um, you can see more details about them, and eventually you can generate this SBOM output as well. So you can copy later this output, save it to a uh, SBOM file, et cetera. So these are, these are just examples. So I think that you guys got, got the idea of what extensions are. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if, if I have a few more minutes, Daniel. Yeah, go for it, go for it. Yeah, so just very quickly, uh, because Daniel is going to show you how how he built this uh, telepresent extension, how how it works. So if any one of you are interested in how to create one, just to let you know very, very quickly, you just need to use the Docker extension CLI. And we provide that init command that you can see here at the top of my screen, where you can create an extension. You are gonna, you're going to get a bunch of questions asked uh, about what is the image of your extension, the title, the description, and eventually you're going to get this boilerplate with, it's just a skeleton with a bunch of files that are, that is basically the extension, right? And once that you have those files, as you can see here, is nothing more does than just a, a UI and a backend container where you can put some logic to, to run your extension. For instance, if you want your UI to communicate with an API, then you have you, you can just basically build uh, build this as a container and deploy that as part of your extension. So that that's pretty pretty much what an extension is about. And you can build the extension as well with this command with with a simpler uh, Docker build. And you can also install it with make install extension, which what it does is uh, apart from building the extension, it runs Docker extension install. And then you will see later that the extension appears on your Docker desktop, and then you can communicate from the UI to that backend container. Yeah. So that is like a very quick overview of what extensions are and how you can build one with the CLI. Impressively, but literally within 30 seconds, right? One minute, you had the framework there for an extension. <laughs> how cool is that, right? So <laughs> loving it. Like, definitely keen to see what folks can uh, do with all that. Superb. Let's share my screen again. And we're back. Thanks for that, Felipe. That's great. So we went through that process that Felipe described, uh, worked with the Docker folks. We were one of the inaugural launch partners, actually, with the extensions. And we packaged Telepresence into the extensions. So let me just move. Don't worry, we do work with other VPNs, like that, that's a thing. But as a mental model for building what telepresence is, it is a bridge between um, local machine and remote machine. You can also think of it as a kubectl port forward on steroids. If you use the port forwards, they're really powerful, but you have to do a port forward for each of the services you want to interact with each of the the ports, right, which can get a bit cumbersome. I'm always messing up the syntax when I'm doing these things. So telepresence makes it much easier with the telepresence connect command, it makes it much easier to hook my local machine up into the remote uh, cluster, particularly the networking stack of the remote cluster. So I can interact with services as if they were local. And it's also, you can think of it, if you've used kubectl proxy, um, it's kubectl proxy all the things is another way of thinking of this thing as well. Always remember, at its core, it is a network bridge between your laptop and the Kubernetes cluster. One way I often chat about it with like with new folks is it is like putting your laptop into the network of the remote cluster. So I can interact again with local services and remote services as if they're in the same space. So I can be local calling into the remote services, which I'll show you a demo that will make more sense in a moment. But this is what telepresence is. But hopefully you're already starting to sort of unlock in your mind with this connection from my local machine into the remote cluster, I can very and get that fast feedback loop going on with dependencies running in a, a remote cluster, right? I don't have to run everything locally. And I can critically share that remote cluster with my other uh, friends in the development team as well. Demo time. Let's uh, quickly set up what I'm going to demo. It is a very simple uh, three service app with an ingress going on there. I've got a web uh, UI. So our user would call into the, uh, I've got, I'm running Ambassador Edge Stack uh, in, in the cluster calls into that ingress, calls into the web service, web service calls into a user service, 
gets a list of users and their preferred emojis. And then web, based on that list of users, calls into the emoji service and gets the codes for the emojis to render correctly on the web page. So in theory, we see a nice um, list. You can see a bunch of folks here with smiles, or in this case, some whales in the mix too as well. I'll do the, the real demo in just a moment. But that's very simple, sort of trivial microservice app, but you can see some interaction with services. It's not just the monolith, right? Like the web service here is kind of monolithic in, in a sense, but it's calling out to services. But your application, I'm sure, will be much more you know, complicated, but the principles will remain the same. What I want to do is develop my services, you know, I want to like spin up, say, web user and emoji, but imagine I can't spin them all up locally because my laptop, you know, I'm going to be working away, but my laptop's going to catch fire, right? And this is a real thing in, in the Java world. I've had a couple of big monoliths that once I'm running the monolith, I couldn't run microservices locally. So this is definitely a, a real thing. What I'm going to do instead is just run the user service locally, but have it interact with the cluster. So I'm going to do telepresence install with Docker desktop. That's going to put a traffic manager within my Kubernetes cluster, setting up a two-way proxy. So I can call into the cluster as if I was actually in the cluster. I'm also going to do an intercept on the user service, super simple through the Docker desktop UI, and then route traffic from the remote request to my local machine. So we're going to make a request against a, a remote ingress, right? A remote version of the app, but then when the web service calls into user, it's going to be rerouted to my local machine. I'm going to change some of the functionality and pass it back through. So we can test the app, the full stack of the app, uh, and develop on one service locally. So we're testing it like, you know, like it's real effectively, right? We're running all the services in one cluster, just working on one service locally and interacting uh, and doing the fast feedback, which I'll show you in the demo. Uh, Daniel, one question. Go for it, yeah. yeah. You go back to the to the slide. Yeah. yeah. For people that are, are watching us, maybe you can explain what is the ambassador H stack, the, the ingress in there. Yeah, happy to feel. Yeah, no, great shout. Always happy to talk about uh, edge stack, right? Or emissary ingress. So effectively, uh, we've got emissary ingress, which is based on uh, Envoy proxy and then edge stack on top. Ambassador edge stack is the way we expose all of our internal services externally. So you notice I'm routing traffic from the edge stack to web, but I'm not routing traffic to user and emoji. So user and emoji are kind of internal backend services, right? And then the web service is what's generating the HTML that's going to be rendered. But the benefits of having a, an ingress like edge stack is you know, self-service. So developers, you can very easily spin up routes, mappings as we call them, to say map this path to this service. You can add observability super simply. You can add security, like authentication, rate limiting, TLS, all that good stuff. Um, and you can do um, a bunch of security stuff as well in terms of, I mentioned rate limiting, but we can integrate with WAFs, that kind of things as well. It's a central point to control access into the cluster. Think of it as like the front door to your house, right? You can lock it, you can put cameras on it to watch it, and you can open the door as you choose, right? That is the function of an ingress in Kubernetes. Good chat, Felipe. It's always uh, always nice to explain the big picture, right? Awesome, thank you. Super. Ah, uh, let's press on. So, Docker desktop extension. I think that's that's my cue to drop down into the command line. So, I've got running in GKE. I've just chosen GKE today. Uh, my three service app. You can see it here, right? I've done. I've aliased K for kubectl because I, I get tired of typing kubectl all the time, right? But I've just said K get service, and just to prove this is live, right? I'll hit return again, get the same answer. You can see I've got my three services: emoji, Java Docker, user Java Docker, web Java Docker. I've also got a quote service we're not going to be looking at today, and the Kubernetes and services there as well, right? I'll also now do kget hosts, a good queue up there, Felipe, because this is actually the host that we're exposing in the Ambassador Edge stack. So you can see here, eager synosy, I think it is, uh, 80, 837 edge stack .me. That's the publicly addressable domain name for accessing our app. So if I now load up Google Chrome, you can see here, Eagle, Eager, I should have picked a better name, right? Eager synosy, I spun this one up this morning, uh, 837 edge .me. If I hit return, that is going out to my remote GKE services, and we're rendering some smileys for myself. Moby has naturally chosen his favorite emoji to be uh, a whale, right? Um, and we're a bunch of other folks there as well with emojis. Now, as I was showing Felipe was, uh, this demo, he was like, clearly for a Docker demo, you need more whales, right? So that's that's our goal today, is to code yeah. more, more, more Mobies of Felipe, right? 
Yeah, I was more. <laughs> that's, that's the deal. But but on their way to that. First off, what I'll do is I'll spin up the uh, um, Docker desktop extension with Telepresence and we'll do some curl into the cluster so you can sort of see the how you'd interact um, with the remote uh, services locally. And then we'll do the uh, what's called the, the intercept where I'm routing traffic to my local machine and to Docker on my local machine. And we'll make some changes to the code. And hopefully if the demo gods are with me. We'll see a lot more Mobies, a lot more whales, right? So first off, uh, let me bring up Docker. Here we go. Exactly what Felipe showed you. I've already um, loaded in Telepresence. I've got rid of actually my rest of my extensions I use just to keep it super simple for the demo. Um, and I've already logged in with, um, with Ambassador Cloud for Telepresence. So once you've done that, you've installed the extension, as Felipe showed you, super simple. You've logged into Ambassador Cloud. The Telepresence is all set up. We are ready to rock here. And I've kept it super simple and I'm using the default um, cube config on my sheet machine to be the context we're working with, same as in my terminal, right? So default is just that cluster um, I'm already connected to uh, with the terminal. So Doc Desktop is the UI you know and love, right? So I can just click on the button, connect, Telepresence words behind the scenes, installs the traffic manager, gets me set up, finds my workloads, and you can see I've got a list of my workloads, which we saw on the CLI just a moment ago, here, ready to, um, ready to rock and roll, right? Now, the fact I'm connected now means that any Docker container I spin up locally has access to the same network namespace as the remote cluster. So we can spin up unit, uh, integration tests, say, in a Docker container. We can also spin up a curl in a Docker container and curl into the services. Now, this will all become uh, clear if I just pop back to my terminal and clear, and I'll go to my cheat sheet on the side. You see me looking on the side here. But what I want to do is I want to run a container and I'm going to map in the network of hosts because that's where Telepresence is running. Telepresence is running in a container uh, within Docker Desktop. And I want to be able to curl, for example, my um, remote service. Now, this, you know, first off, it looks a bit strange. I'm curling emoji Java Docker dot default. That's the namespace ports on the paths. Like without using Telepresence, there's no way I could curl locally into that remote namespace, right? Because like it's not registered on the interwebs anywhere. I can curl into the ingress, as like Felipe was talking uh, and I were talking about. If you expose services externally, you can curl them. But my internal, my backend services, like Emoji Java Docker, I can't normally curl into. Let's hit return. We get some data back, right? Because I'm spinning up a Docker container locally using network host, which is the same network that Telepresence is running on. And now I can interact with the remote um, cluster as if it was local. I can go poking around the API, right? And to make it even easier, what I do uh, often is I'll just alias that command I'm running because it's a little bit cumbersome, right? I'm going to alias that to Docker curl. So you'll notice Docker curl, I've left off the actual target um, domain name I'm looking at. So I'll just hit return there. Got my alias up and running, right? I'll then do a curl. If I now put the um, emoji voto, service so this is oops i got that twice classic right uh that's the drawback of a cheat sheet just docker curl target emojis da -da, looks good right to make it you know a bit more friendly we can pipe the output through to jq and we get our nice um you know uh, json formatted output from our emoji service running in the cluster and telepresence is bridging my local machine into the cluster so already like when i did this demo at conferences this blows folks minds you know as it did with me when i bumped into telepresence back in I think it was 2017, 2018, uh, I suddenly realized, wow, I can interact with the remote Kubernetes cluster as if it was local. Anything that is addressable in that Kubernetes cluster, you may have named services, databases, we can curl it. We can spin up a MySQL client and interact with the remote database in the cloud, for example. This already is super powerful. But the so, real magic, oh, sorry, could we go for it? Yeah, so, so far you haven't really run any local microservice, right? That's you it. haven't spin up anything locally to run. You're just connecting nope. to a cluster. So you install the extension and then you are just connected right away. You That's just it. don't need to do anything more. Yeah, literally, like, you just get that connect button. And already this is like super powerful, right? To your point, as in you can literally be exploring the services. And I often do this when I'm trying to figure out an API, right? I might look at the swagger or the open API spec, but I want to poke and prod it because let's be honest, like the spec lies, right? So you actually want to like try it. So like you say, literally connect in. Do you Docker, you've got to be in the container, you've got to be on the network host. That is the, the, sort of the constraints here. But yeah, you can start poking and prodding. I can put in you know, parameters, I can play around and I can load it into JQ and see what comes back. So yeah, to your point, Felipe, the next bit of the demo, I'll be spinning up a container uh, locally. But other than that, I've just connected with the extension. 
good shout. Uh, so that sort of um, that's this bit of the demo. The, the probably the more exciting bit like, is the interception, right? So what I'll do now is I'll go back to Docker Desktop here, and I'm going to intercept the user Java Docker service. Now what I'm going to do, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm a big IntelliJ fan. I've got IntelliJ run here. Like this is the um, user app here. It is ridiculously simple. I'm not going to lie. Spring Boot app, right? Three services, REST controller, DTOs, and, and some like very fake data. I've literally hard coded there, right? Um, I'm going to, you know, because we've got to run the app within a container. So what I'm going to do, I'll put this command into my terminal and explain it. I'm going to, oops, no, missed. I'm going to do a Docker run. Let me just move this so I can see it properly. I'm going to run uh, my user Java Docker service, but I'm going to volume mount my present working directory source into the container under workspace source. And I'll show you behind the scenes what's going on in a moment. But the magic here, I've actually created this um, image, the Daniel Bryant UK slash user Java Docker service. I've created it with a tool called Pack. Now, it's an open source CNCF tool, basically a build pack tool, right? I don't need to worry about the Docker file in this case. Big fan of Docker files, and I do use them many times. But the Pack uh, command is great for developing, super simple. And I've enabled hot reload within the pack tool. I'm actually using a Google scaffold container. So it's going to be watching for changes in my code in the workspace source directory. So I'm mounting my local um, code into the container. So we do changes in the ID locally. It'll refresh in the container, and we can see the changes going right. So it will all become clear with the demo. Let me just hit return. Um, oh, looks good. We can see a Spring Boot app, standard app spinning up. That has done nicely. So I've got a local version of user running, only user, right? Not the web app, not the ingress, not the other services, just the user service running locally. If I go to the desktop, I shall do uh, intercept on user Java Docker, pops up some details. We can go into this more, but basically it's like saying, what port uh, do you want to map the remote port to my local port? Uh, and it's asking for my ingress because we're going to be passing a header through the stack to identify that it's my interception and not Felipe say. Now Felipe and I can share intercepts, but I have to give him what's called the preview URL, which we're working on, which we'll generate on, uh, generate in just a moment. You can do multiple um, interceptions of the same service in a single remote cluster, that's totally fine. And that means you can kind of carve out isolated bubbles of services that we're working on. So Felipe and I could pair, uh, and it wouldn't inter, uh, interact with someone else who's running a separate interception, because we'll, they can generate a separate preview URL. Effectively, they use a separate header under the hood. But it's really cool for sharing a staging environment and, and pairing with your colleagues without tripping over each other, um, as is very common if you're not using something like Telepresence, right? Let me do the submit. Behind the background, uh, behind the background now, we're putting uh, it's an Envoy proxy. Actually, we deploy into the pod. It's a sidecar process. It works fine with other sidecars. If you're running Linkerd, Istio, service meshes, uh, that'll be fine. No problems. We can work with you on that one. But it spins up a sidecar and it's routing now traffic to my um, select traffic to my local machine. And if we click, uh, you can see here, user Java doc service, namespace default, target port. This is where our intercepts show up. Now, if I click on the browser. Uh, icon here, I can load this preview URL I've got into my browser. And what we should see is you can you actually, I don't know if you saw behind the background, my debug kicked off there in the IDE, and I'm rendering the same page, albeit via the preview URL now. So if I swap between, this is the original, right? This is what we get uh, in production. And this is what we're getting uh, now when I'm accessing the preview URL. But as I'm hitting refresh, right, you can see um, some probably some uh, debug uh, how often that goes through, spinning up behind the scenes as we're accessing the service. I will put some more debug in in just a moment, actually, so you can see it even clearly. But now I'm routing all traffic, oh, oh sorry, traffic by the preview URL to my user service on my local machine. So if I make a change, right, let's drop back to my IDE. This is like a super hacky, please don't do in production type change, right? I'm literally just going to hard code to return whales for every user. And then when the web app calls out to the emoji service, it's just going to get all whales, right? So I've literally just now uncommented my, my cheat sheet here, my block. I'm going to hit save and watch what happens down here because I've got hot reload in my container, right? I hit save. The web app reloads. The, the um, dev mode in the pack container recognizes I've made a change instantly pretty much, right? It's rebuilt, redeployed, and now I can test. If I hit the um, 
refresh on my URL now, we should see a change. Fingers crossed the demos gods as always, right? If I hit refresh, ta da we have all whales. To your request, Felipe, many more emojis, right? Many more uh, emojis, sorry. Amazing, amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta love the whales, right? And as, uh, like, as you can, uh, I mentioned, you can see if you watch, if I split the screens, actually, I'll do it, that one uh, there, that one over here. As I'm making requests, you can see debug information popping up over here in my um, in my terminal. So it is actually, I'm accessing the remote um, uh, ingress, the remote services, but it's routing through locally and I can make those fast changes locally, right? Um, and I know some folks are often suspicious about this, so I'll, I'll show you a little bit behind the, the scenes or prove it out. So if I go um, now back to my original URL, right, and click refresh, I don't see any difference because I'm not using the preview URL, I'm not using the header, when my request arrives at the user service, it doesn't get routed to my local machine. Now you can override the preview URLs are a much easier way of doing it. So I recommend using preview URLs, but if you do drop into the Docker um, desktop extension and click the terminal, you can see behind the scenes a little bit, you get a header that you need to propagate through the stack. And the header is simply X telepresence intercept ID. If you're using um, Spring Cloud Sleuth as I'm using here, many of the frameworks have the same kind of thing, right? You can just bundle this header along with the open telemetry or the B3 headers that you're propagating down through the stack already. So it's a pretty simple lift. Uh, older applications, you may need to you know, make a few modifications, but if I just copy that header, right? And I've got a extension in my Chrome, actually I've already got the intercept uh, header set up. If I just paste now um, that header in, sorry, that value in and then refresh, I'm actually seeing all the whales, right? So I'm hitting the main ingress URL, passing the header in, and I'm seeing the whales the same as I would if I'm using that secure preview URL here. But if I now go back, clear out that, refresh, and I see the, the emojis back again, right? So you imagine like someone could be testing against like this staging environment. They're completely unaware of what Felipe and I are doing with the whales. Our master plan of rolling out more mobies, right? Can be, you know, delayed till later. We get that fast feedback. Telepresence is not a cheat for CI or CD. Once Felipe and I are happy with this change, right? We're still gonna, you know, do the Docker build, the Docker push, trigger off CI. We're gonna do some security stuff. You showed Felipe with the S-bombs, that kind of things. Uh, that happens, you know, in Spinnaker, Jenkins, GitHub Actions, wherever you're taking your pick. The, um, in this use case, telepresence is great for fast feedback on that dev workflow. Right, let me pop back into the slides. We can always cover some more questions uh, after the talk. And um, this is just my um, like cheat sheet for folks. And we will share the slides. You can download the slides. You can just see what I've um, gone through there in the demo. Always nice to have a backup in the slides. Some key scenarios, right? I mentioned this sort of remocal, and I totally stole this word. I think it was the Influx DB folks, they're big telepresence users, and they talked about remocal development, remote, local, remocal, right? I kind of liked it, right? It kind of stuck. Um, work with me on this one, you know, hopefully we'll see it more over <laughs> the next like few months and years, right? But effectively with telepresence, putting your laptop in the cluster, you can get that, that local to remote, that remote local feedback super quick. If you wanna know more, I did a whole talk oh, a month ago now, I think it was in London at Jack's London, Java themed talk, but I walked folks through their options, you know, versus mocking, service virtualization, remote development, and the slides are on SlideShare. The video should be up pretty soon. I think uh, Jack's are usually pretty efficient. And um, so if you wanna get more of a like low level code type walkthrough, this is the talk for you. Um, and when the slides, sorry, when the video shared, I'll be sure to tweet it out and so forth. But in the risk of kind of like, there was 40 minutes build up to this slide, right? But at the risk of kind of simplifying it, this is what I recommended, uh, not just my thoughts, my whole team, other folks I've chatted to, when different approaches are useful for different scenarios. So I'm a massive fan of mocks, you know, in Ruby, mocks everything. In Java, I love um, Mockito, that kind of thing, right? Um, big fan of service virtualization, wire mock, uh, Mounty Bank, test containers, that kind of stuff, right? And obviously a big fan of Remocal working on the telepresence tool. But I'm saying, you know, when you're doing unit testing, stay in the mocks if you can, but then as you go through to the more complex testing, this is when things like remote development come into their own, particularly for poking and prodding around an API. I really do love telepresence for, for that. But as with anything, there's always trade-offs with all the tools here and know and choose accordingly, right? 
Continuous delivery, I've mentioned it a few times. It's, you know, we've done whole workshops in Ambassador Labs. I know there's good Docker folks are you know, doing many uh, sessions on this too. Continuous delivery is a huge topic, um, but one that's really important to understand. And as you move to the cloud, as you embrace Docker, um, you also want to change some of your um, practices in terms of you want to run Docker locally, right? If you're running containers in production, uh, please don't do some anti patterns I saw when I was consulting where folks would build everything locally with no containers in sight. They'd push down CI with no containers in sight. And then once everything in CI and CD had been verified, they put it in a container and shipped it to production. And I was horrified, right? Because you want to test this production like as early as possible. There may be like obviously extra things going in the container, right? An operating system, other dependencies. You want to package locally. That's that Docker build that, you know, playing around with the container, running the vulnerability scanners. And definitely in CI, you want to be running everything as it's going to be run in production in a container. Back when I was doing my uh, talk, I think I'm actually I'm referencing this one here, back in, it was in Barcelona, 2018, where I was on the DockerCon stage, uh, live, and it was, it was fantastic in Barcelona. I talked a lot about limitations of the JVM at the time had with uh, in certain modes within a container, the way it was ma ma managing memory, because like the JVM is a 25 year old, I think, technology, and Docker's you know, containers are a bit newer. There was a bit of a collision. Uh, a lot of those challenges I think of like with memory and the JVM and the CPU have been overcome now but back you know 2018 it was still a thing just to be conscious of so you want to be, be building in containers you want to be developing in containers as early as possible right um I've got to shout out my book here as well that I wrote with Abraham basically the talk that we did at DockerCon was based on on this book so a little bit old now but hopefully the principles of continuous delivery with Docker, with containers, and um, stay the same as well. And, and did I mention it's you know, Christmas is coming? Perfect time to buy a book for your loved ones, right? Gonna put it out there. If you're looking to use Telepresence in this use case now, we've got a GitHub action for you. I didn't have this when I was doing the, the initial talk there, um, but play around with this, love your feedback. Um, you can actually, instead of using a local machine going into a remote cluster, you can use a, a CI CD instance, a GitHub runner within a different uh, cluster. So you can map that context, that you know, that run context into a remote cluster, which is, is fantastic as well. Lots of options with telepresence. We're mainly focusing on the, the kind of like the path to production today, right? In terms of like the local dev experience with the extensions, but there's many more opportunities um, for telepresence to be useful in, in your workflow. Wrapping up, we're looking pretty good on time. So telepresence is a CNCF project, a lot of the Docker tech behind the scenes open source CNCF project. Some folks say to me, oh, this you know, container thing looks super easy. This telepresence thing looks super easy. I could code that in a weekend. Maybe you could, probably you couldn't. But my pitch here really is, is a vast community of Docker users, Docker contributors, telepresence maintainers. Get involved with them rather than doing your own thing. We've got some fantastic companies all over the world that you know, are contributing code into all these projects. They're using all the tech. They're battle testing it right. So my pitch to you today is have a look. When you've got a problem, like that fast feedback situation, go and look in the open source community. Go and have a look at the CNCF landscape, right? I know it's a little bit overwhelming at times, but there's a lot of great solutions in there. Jump into our Slack in Ambassador Labs or Docker Slack if you want some guidance on these things. But my advice is there's a lot of great tools out there. Don't reinvent the wheel. Install Docker Desktop, get playing. If you really want to create an extension, that's totally cool, right? You use one of the tools that's out there and plug it in an extension, but know what's out there rather than kind of doing everything from first principles is my pitch here. Oh, and there's telepresence in the air, yeah. So wrapping up, the TLDR we talked about, right? The inner dev loop can get painful as you move to microservices and Kubernetes. There's just more services, there's more infrastructure layers. A lot of benefits, but the inner dev loop can be one of those challenges. Docker Desktop is a great on-ramp to that cloud native loop, right? And with extensions like Felipe showed, Many more things are possible now. It's a great second IDE to be developing in. Love my JetBrains, love my VS Code, love my Docker Desktop too. Telepresence proxies your local machine into the cluster, giving you that fast feedback. Like Felipe and I were talking about, you can literally just do a curl into the cluster, right? You can get the intercepts going on as well. The remote development is very powerful. Once you get your head around it, I can run yeah, a subset of services locally and a bunch remotely. It is a game changer. Trust me, it's really, really powerful. This, you know, what we're calling remote development uh, is really quite powerful. And Telepresence, in combination with you know, Docker and Docker Desktop, supports several workflows. We mainly focus on the remote use case today, but again, CI, CD, and think about that whole path to production, right? Both the Ambassador Labs teams and the Docker teams, we're all about that. We're all about, you know, we want to get you successful. We want to get that idea you've got into production 
as quickly and as safely as possible. But there's a bunch of things you need to bear in mind as you move to technologies like Kubernetes that may just change your workflow. And we're here to help with that. I'll pause on this slide. We can open up for questions, Felipe. Uh, the sample code is all available. I need to do a better job with the readme. I just realized that today. So I'll finish the readme over the next few days. Um, check out the extensions. I know that like Felipe gave a demo of, of how you can get set up. The extensions website is fantastic. And there's a bunch of tutorials out there. You can play around with those. Um, and if you want to know more about the extension itself, we've got some um, guides for Java, for Go, some other languages too. Uh, and you can actually go straight to the extension uh, link. Uh, Docker Hub, you can link to the extensions now, so you can dive straight in uh, and, and install that extension super easily in Docker Desktop as well. Oh, thank you very much. Great presenting with you, uh, Felipe. Now is the time we can hopefully answer a few questions. Let's spin up the chat. Oh, I see a bunch of Q&A. Oh, <laughs> chat is disabled. <laughs> Don't, uh, sorry about that. Um, let me have a quick look. Can we write, one for you, Felipe, can we write Docker extensions on arbitrary languages using an arbitrary framework? We saw there was NPM, but uh, can I use React under the hood, for example? Yeah, that's a very good question. <clears throat> Sorry, that's a very good question. Because at the moment, you can use any kind of front-end technology. You can use React, Angular, Vue, Svelte. As long as you have a framework that generates an index HTML with some CSS, JavaScript uh, assets, then you're good to go. What we are doing with Docker extensions is to build and, and let's say to display all these assets, to load them from this extension inside a web view, inside Docker desktop. So we are just basically hosting some guest content, with, which in this case is your, your UI. You know, it, it doesn't matter how you build it. You can just put an index HTML page, you know, just plain HTML and it will work as well. So. And you can also have a backend container, but this is something optional. So you can use uh, Compose if you need your UI to connect okay. to other uh, containers. You know, if you need your API to do some operations, for instance. So you can have the UI connecting with that backend container and requesting data, for instance, or keeping some kind of a state, or connecting to volumes, or creating other Docker containers on the fly through the SDK. So there are a bunch of possibilities. Fantastic, Lube. Yeah, excellent. And, um, I think that covers the question very well. So, yeah, great question there and good shout. Uh, I've got one from Seppi. Uh, how does how does Telepresence work if two developers are using uh, are working on the user service at the same time? So the magic, great question, Seppi. The magic is all to do with headers. When you use the preview URL, we automatically inject a header for you and we manage security for you as well using Ambassador Cloud. So if you imagine when the intercept um, sets up that sidecar service I talked about, that sidecar pod, um, if a certain header is set, it gets routed to my machine. You could spin up a second preview URL, a second intercept, right? You'd have a different preview URL, a different header. So when you make the request, the, the container, the sidecar, the traffic agent, as we call it, is smart enough to go, ah, that's Sethi's header. I'll then route it to your local machine. So that's how we work on uh, one service simultaneously. And again, like you can share that preview URL with an arbitrary number of people. So Felipe and I can be pairing away, right? You can be pairing away with your team and we won't see the, um, we won't sort of uh, collide together. The only case you've got to be watching out for is if you're mutating state in a shared data store, which is kind of a given in this situation, right? Like if I mutate the state outside of my container um, in the remote cluster, you will see that potentially if you're making the same call. But other than that, in terms of coding, we're isolated based on the headers. So you need to propagate those headers down through the stack using something like Spring Cloud Sleuth or, or your framework of choice. Um, but it's all the magic is all to do with headers that was set and the traffic agent with telepresence running as a sidecar is smart enough to make routing decisions uh, based on, on that um, that header. Uh, one question, Daniel, uh, similar mm -hmm. to that. So when when this side, sidecar container is created, is added to the pod and the, the original pod, let's say, is restarted somehow or, or, or is untouched? Yeah. Great shout. Yes, it is restarted. So we do, uh, the first time it happens, basically we inject um, a, a separate container into that pod. And if folks are looking, um, they will see like, you know, two or two, for example, like in the CLI where there's a second container running in that pod. And um, we only spin up, uh, I think actually I saw a very similar question today. We only spin up one traffic agent container per pod. So if say, you know, you and I are coding away, then Seppi jumps in and codes, the, it's, the telepresence is smart enough to know not to spin up multiple sidecars. Um, so it's nice and simple, good for resources as well, right? We just use that one traffic agent. 
a bunch of folks can kind of effectively share that um, that traffic agent. Nice, thank you. All right. Um, what else? We've got. Uh, can I use telepresence with Nomad backends? I'm assuming you mean HashiCorp Nomad. There, a great question, Ravi. Um, so at the moment, telepresence only runs in Kubernetes. So the simple answer there is, if you're running Kubernetes, you can have all the fun we've showed today. If you're using Nomad, not yet. Uh, it is an open source project. You can feel free to create a request. We always appreciate those requests. But I think it'd be quite a big lift uh, in terms of Nomad is a very different architecture than, than Kubernetes. A great question. Uh, what else have we got there? Um, lots of little telepresence questions there, I think. Uh, don't know, anyone catch your eye, Felipe? I'm, I'm trying to read. It's always tricky when you're presenting and trying to read the questions. I apologize, everyone. Um, so I'm running Istio in my Kubernetes cluster. Will telepresence be compatible with it? Yes, there is a, um, uh, some good docs on our website that cover um, if you're running multiple sidecars. So with Istio, you already have an Envoy sidecar. Telepresence injects the traffic agent alongside it. There is some interesting things about the order of the uh, traffic flowing through those sidecars, but the doc should cover that. And if not, jump in our Slack. Um, I should have linked that off the slides actually, but it's a8r.io slash Slack. Jump into our Slack and, and uh, the team of uh, the community will, will help you out with that one as well. Um, da -da -da. Uh, there's an interesting question from Jesus around um, use cases. So, Felipe, I'll put this from your way. You, when you first saw the Docker desktop extension with Telepresence, I know like you, you tweeted and that's really appreciated. What were you thinking was your preferred use case? What, what kind of what opened up for you when you were like, hey, this is awesome? Yeah, well, actually, it was a, it was a funny story because uh, I actually did a, did a demo about Telepresence at Docker internally. <laughs> and, and it was, of course, trying out the Moji Volto uh, application, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, the first thing that blow that yeah that exploded my mind was how easy it was to connect because when I was working with Kubernetes before I always find I I, I I always found a hard time just to try to connect to an internal service you know just to my yeah, back yeah. API exactly. it's like how, how is it possible or how is it so difficult <laughs> for me to you know to connect to something that should be you know running inside my cluster you know i have i have been using the built-in kubernetes cluster in docker desktop and yeah, i couldn't yeah. sometimes you know to reach this service i had to use port forward expose a node service yeah so that was something you know uh, mind-blowing and then when i of course when i went one step further and i you know ran this service locally in my machine yeah. and i could create you know this global or personal intercept uh, i could put a breakpoint inside my ide inside Visual Studio Code, and I could stop the execution of that request, inspect the values of my variables, and then continue. You know that that was amazing because it meant a lot, a lot to me. It's like, well, I can even receive traffic from outside, you know, from my external cluster inside my machine, and see, you know, what the hell is going on. So that, that <laughs> yes, was, that, that was just yes, yeah, impressive. So I think that you guys are doing a really, really good job with telepresence here. Appreciate it, Felipe. Yeah, no, it was great fun chatting to you and a few of your colleagues when um, we first like uh, we were working on the extension, right? And I had uh, like even it was like five years ago now, I guess I had exactly the same response, right? I was like, "What? I can access my services just by the service name? What is yeah. this magic?" <laughs> and then like, like it went exactly the same journey. I was like, "And you can intercept like like that is just fantastic, right?" So we've been on the same journey. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, there's a uh, oh, go for it. Yeah, there, there is some magic that they would really like to. Start. If, if possible, if you could explain, which is you, you have been using, you have not been uh, using a, a Docker file for that, and you have been mapping the source code inside the container. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so it's like okay, that's very fast. But imagine that people that are watching us, they are not using that kind of technology. They just have Docker file. So, mm. what, what would be like the normal workflow here? For them to follow. Oh, that's a great question, Felipe. So I, I do push people towards using the like hot reload tools, right? And I, I just use Pack, um, uh, which is a uh, people can Google this CNCF tool. Um, it just makes it so much easier to set up the hot reload. But you can totally do this. Like, um, for example, I'm a big Spring user, so big Java user, right? Um, a Spring has this um, extension called uh, so extension in the Spring world called Dev Tools, and basically it enables hot reload. Do you know what I mean? So what I do is I write my Docker file. I'd say, you know, uh, from OpenJDK, I'd map in the Spring Boot app I was working on, and I would set a flag in like as I'm, you know, Java da 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 name flag uh, to to hot reload. So 
other frameworks have got exactly the same. I think I'm trying to think what I use in Go. Is it Kite or something? I can't remember. Uh, Air. I think it's Air or something. Like in, in Go, uh, I've yeah. used. Yeah, there's a bunch of like and and, it, and like npm's got um is it npm run or something I've used. There's a bunch of um like basically it sort of does a, a watch on the file system and does an action when a file mm -hmm. changes, right? So yeah. you know, pick your poison, folks. Whatever language you're using, there's usually a solution. And the hot reload uh, is the most common way to Google to search for it, right? Just type in like Java hot reload, Java TypeScript, JavaScript hot reload, Go hot reload, and then you can bake that into your Docker file. Felipe, do you know what I mean? And you're a bit careful sometimes you might want to do like a multi-stage Docker file because um, you don't want to load those dev tools into your final container. That's one caveat I just mentioned. Um, like when I'm actually using the pack tool, there's different modes you can build. Like you can build a dev container effectively and build a production container. And you want to be pushing that production container down your CI CD pipeline because that's what's actually going to be run. But that CI, that um lightweight container typically has a very lightweight os alpine something like that right um, and minimal dependencies it's actually going to be you know secure performant for production um but yeah multi-stage docker file gets you in that situation as well you can have your dev tools version of the app where you do the hot reload and then you have um the production version of the app in the multi-stage as well mm -hmm. i awesome. also saw that, that you were like uh, running the service inside a container yes yeah, it, it... Is it mandatory or can I also run that service, that, that application? Oh, yes. great question. Great question. You know, I saw a few others, uh, for other folks asking that. For the Docker extension to work, yes, you do need to run it in a container because um, the telepresence binary is effectively running within Docker on the host network. That makes sense, right? So you saw when I was doing my alias, my little cheat with Docker curl, I was um, doing Docker run dash dash network equals host. Um, so yes, I mean, I've got a bunch of other demos um, we can do another day where I'm spinning up, um, it's actually a node example where I'm running uh, integration tests uh, locally, so to speak, right, against the remote target. But I do spin up those integration tests in a container and map the, the network to be host. So yes, if you're using the extension, the, all the power that comes with the extension, right, not needing to memorize the telepresence CLI tools. And um, the caveat to that is you do have to run the processes uh, within a Docker container to get access to telepresence. Good question. I know we're dangerously close to the time there. I think it's a good point to, to wrap up. Um, yeah, and I, I think I'll just quickly check all my notes here. Hopefully the um, the links there are useful, folks. Do you know? let us know. Uh, reach out via email. Join our Slacks. Tweet at us. We love getting involved. If you found this useful, you'd like to see more of it, what would you like to see more of? The questions, I apologize. Like um, We'll definitely get to all the questions we haven't answered because there was a lot there. Um, we can follow up uh, via email, via Slack. We can do a blog post, something like that. So we will get to those questions. But yeah, do reach out to us. We'd love to know what you think of these, um, these sessions. Were they helpful? How can they be improved? And I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felipe, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone.